Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines. We broadcast live on Mondays at 10 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. from the Think Tech Hawaii studio in the Pioneer Plaza in downtown Honolulu. Today's guest is Senator Will Espero. He has been an extremely popular senator for 19 years and has been involved in state and county government for 27 years total. And he's a candidate for lieutenant governor. Today, we are going beyond politics. Senator Will, thank you for being here today. Good morning, Rusty. Aloha. Thanks for having me. You have, on the campaign um, signs that you have for lieutenant governor, it's the silhouette of your hat and your glasses. It's very recognizable. It's super cool. I just had to say that. But before we get into your campaign uh, you know, for lieutenant governor, can you tell me some about your early life? Well, my parents are from the Philippines. Mm -hmm. My dad was fortunate enough to be uh, selected to join the United States Navy in 1954. Uh -huh. And his first station was in Yokosuka, Japan at the U.S. Navy base. And that's where I was born in 1960 in Japan. From Japan, we came to the United States. And actually, my mother told me that my first birthday was on the ship. Oh, I said, wow. Back then, we didn't take a plane. We took a ship. And uh, then we landed in California, and from there, um, being in the Navy uh, through my dad, uh, we lived around the world. Washington, California, Virginia, Georgia, Florida, Cuba, Guantanamo Bay before it was famous, and Naples, Italy. Uh, I attended Seattle University. And after college in 1982, I came to Hawaii, and I've been here for 30-plus years. This is my home. This is where I've lived most of my life. I wouldn't live anywhere else. This is such a beautiful place with wonderful people, and I'm happy to be here and to be able to serve our state through government. Oh, for sure. I mean, you have, you've lived in a variety of places, obviously, through being in a military family. Yes. What were the challenges, um, you know, moving around so much? I would say that is the challenge, or if not the challenge, it was just uh, the norm and the way of life where you move every two or three years. So, so you really didn't have any long-term friends per se. I'm sure that today now it's a little different with social media because people can stay connected uh, on the various uh, social media platforms. But uh, back then, uh, you know, you had to write by letter and. When you're growing up, most of us probably wouldn't be letter writers or unless you had a pen pal. Um, although in Washington State on Whidbey Island, my dad was stationed there three times. Great. So uh, we were there third grade, sixth grade, high school. So I guess I have some history going back to third grade there. But, but overall, you know, just moving around uh, was something that you learned to live with. It was a great opportunity to meet people, to see places that others may not have seen. Um, but uh, certainly it would be nice to have old-time Hanabata friends, um, like you know when I talk to my friends and others here in Hawaii, uh, people that were born and raised together their whole lives. But I'd say now with the 30 plus years I've been here, I've established some great relationships and friendships. And um, uh, certainly to be here with uh, the spirit of aloha, you know, the Asian uh, Pacific leaning, it makes Hawaii so unique and, and beautiful, and I'm glad to be able to, to serve the people. You know, you've, you're definitely a people person. Uh, now, what, what lessons have you learned from your youth that really shaped your character? Well, my parents uh, were great in that they got me involved in uh, activities. And I believe that uh, that is something that uh, we in the state, families, um, should have opportunities for our youth. So not only provide them the best education, but give them extracurricular activities to stay out of trouble, stay away from drugs, stay away from negative influences. So I was one, and I enjoyed being in uh, Little League 
soccer, baseball, football, all of the sports I was involved in. Uh, I was a Boy Scout. Uh, I played the band, uh, the trumpet in band. And now that's one thing that I regret that I stopped playing the trumpet really? uh, in, in high school, just because there's so many other activities and things I was involved with. Uh, so um, I wish I had continued because I pick up a trumpet now and it's, it's a little more difficult because of the, the buzzing of the lips and it takes consistency and practice. As you know, as a coach, you got to practice sure. and play and play. But uh, uh, overall, uh, my parents, you know, they guided me and directed me in, in the right direction. And it's, it's important that uh, I think that our youth, our keiki, uh, do stay involved in, in positive activities so that we could um, keep them away from uh, all the negative influences that are out there, whatever they may be. You mentioned um, soccer. So many parents in our state, they, they're involved in coaching soccer teams uh, with their sons and daughters. Right. Were you ever a coach uh, oh, for your sons or your def kids? Definitely. I coached AYSO soccer for about six years from when they were five or six to you know, 10 or 12, that age group. And I must say we had good teams, we had winning percentages, and, and yeah, that was one of the the highlights of my life, uh, to be able to teach children and, and your own kids and to have a great time on the field, and, and if you win, even better. Yes. Now, you mentioned that you got your college degree from Seattle University. Yes. And it was in business management. Correct. How has that degree helped you uh, since graduating college? Well, in order to understand business, mm -hmm. you have to know about um, organizations, you have to know about people, you have to know numbers, you have to know economics, and all of that learning in, uh, in college uh, obviously is important uh, when you get out of college, when you're raising a family, whatever job or career one has. You know, it's important to understand that uh, businesses, and especially small businesses, uh, which is the the core of our economy, there are hundreds of thousands, you know, I think over 100,000 small businesses in our state. Um, you know, they need support, they need help, and, and they have um, limited resources as well, and we need to be able to understand their dilemma and help them and help our businesses prosper while at the same time understand that uh, the worker has a family, uh, they need to make a decent wage to pay their bills, and there's a, a delicate balance, especially in government, when you're talking about business, when you're talking about the social needs of our community and, and everyone, and when you're talking about um, nonprofits and, and others, and, and how do we mesh them all together so that everyone is able to, to, to prosper and to, to survive, basically, especially in a place like Hawaii where we have a very high cost of living. You definitely have a great understanding of the various dynamics of business. Now, how did you get your start in politics? My first job was with Mayor Frank Fossey. Um, my friend was the executive secretary of the Neighborhood Commission, uh, basically in charge of Oahu's neighborhood board system, a community association sanctioned by the city government, and they talk about issues and concerns um, that uh, government is involved with, and they give advice. Uh, neighborhood boards are advisory in nature. Uh, but my friend left the position. He asked me if I'd be interested in applying, and I applied, and I was selected, and I was with uh, Mayor Frank Fossey for eight years. He hired me when I was 26 years old, so uh, it was, uh, an interesting situation. I was a little anxious when I got in there being so young and being a first job in government. But uh, uh, the mayor was a, a good boss. Uh, I had uh, many good people around me and uh, those were some uh, great times working at Honolulu Hale under the legendary Mayor Frank Fossey who did so much for our city and county. Yeah, Mayor Fossey is definitely legendary. He, he was extremely positive. He did some very impactful things uh, to really help Hawaii and the people of Hawaii. How, how would you describe him as a leader? 
as a leader, yeah. Mayor Fossey fights for the little guy. Mm -hmm. So he's not thinking about you know, big money or, or, or major contributors. His reputation was for the little guy. He got the job done. Sometimes uh, he, he crossed the line now and then, but he knew how far he can push it. Uh, for example, you know, when he uh, uh, you know, made Honolulu Hale the, the, the parking lot, he destroyed the parking lot and, and they put grass all around. And that was something I think that was uh, not planned through the full permit process, but he did it. It was a good thing. People liked it, and he got the job done. But uh, no, he he was vocal. He was one who spoke his mind. When there was an issue or problem, he would bring it to someone's attention, and uh, he he made people accountable. And that's so important, that, you know, as a leader and as somebody um, in in a management area to, to hold your employees accountable and your staff accountable to make certain that they know what the job that has to be done you know they have the resources and tools to do it and and he lets them do it without micromanaging now you've been involved in a variety of leadership positions over the years yes. uh, tell me tell me about them well it started uh, even before i was in politics i was one of those individuals who was very involved in the community and in the neighborhoods you know when my children were going to school I was part of the PTSA. I was with the um, community-based um, management system of the schools. Uh, it was on the neighborhood board as well, the Eva neighborhood board. I was the founder of the Friends of the Eva Beach Library. There was an organization called the West Oahu Economic Development Association on the board of the Boys and Girls Club. I, I served on countless boards. Uh, as a director, sometimes as an officer, sometimes as the president or the chair. And, and that in itself was a great learning opportunity. In those situations, you're a volunteer, uh, you're not getting paid, um, but you still have a lot of responsibility, and usually you have like-minded volunteers helping you. And, and it's a good place where you could hone your skills and learn to be better um, in the JCs, you're familiar with the Junior Chamber of Commerce. Sure, uh, that's that's a great leadership organization where I was able to meet a lot of people and, and learn a lot as well. You've introduced very important legislation over the years to really help Hawaii and the people of Hawaii. Can you share with me some of those? Oh, sure. I've been involved in over the course of my 19 years so many issues from um, building an aerospace industry, uh, trying to bring STEM jobs, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And uh, one endeavor and initiative we're working on now is space tourism. Uh, we're hoping that in the near future, the FAA will uh, grant us a spaceport license from the Kona Airport and next generation airplanes, space planes, will, will take people into lower Earth orbit. And, of course, that will enhance tourism. I was a key architect in the medical cannabis program and establishing that. Uh, that's been around now for a few years. It took us a while to get to the point of opening dispensaries, but uh, I was the lead senator when that bill passed, and uh, we have our first dispensaries now open. It's still uh, a work in progress. There's still a learning curve, but we finally have medical cannabis available to, to patients uh, because now we have it as a health issue, you know, not a law enforcement issue anymore. Uh, big bill that we passed this year was banning the sale of sunscreens with oxybenzone and oxynoxate. Uh, we started this initiative in 2017. I introduced the first legislation to have a ban and we were able to pass a bill this year, and uh, this is to protect our coral reefs, our ocean environment, and, and this is a bill that uh, we're the first in the nation, and many people around the world were w watching to see how we were gonna deal with this environmental issue. Uh, 
That's such a that's such a, a big issue because we all it affects all of us living in Hawaii. Right. Um, we're gonna we're gonna take a sixty second break. You're watching Beyond the Lines, and my guest is Senator Will Sparrow, candidate for lieutenant governor. Do you want to be cool like me? If so, watch my show on Tuesdays at 1, called Out of the Comfort Zone. I sang this song to you because I think you either are cool or have the potential to be seriously cool. And I want you to come watch my show, where I bring in experts who talk all about easy strategies to be healthier, happier, build better relationships, and make your life a success. So come sit with the cool kids at Out of the Comfort Zone on Tuesdays at 1. See you there. Hello, I'm Cynthia Lee Sinclair. I have a show called Finding Respect in the Chaos. It's all about women's rights and gender equality. It's a place for survivors of abuse to come on and tell their stories, and a place for advocates to come on and share important resources so that people can get past the abuse and into the hope and healing that's on the other side. I hope you'll join me every other Friday at 3 o'clock for Finding Respect in the Chaos. I'm Cynthia Lee Sinclair on ThinkTechHawaii.com. Welcome back to Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My guest is Senator Will Esparrow, candidate for Lieutenant Governor. Senator Will, can you share with me more uh, legislation that, that you were responsible for? Sure, I'd like to um, mention a few more that I think are very important. Uh, one has to do with uh, prison reform and improving our correctional system. Uh, I've been a strong advocate in uh, making certain that our inmates have resources for rehabilitation because uh, we have a, a revolving door problem with our um, prisoners. And right now, about 50% of them had been in prison previously. So we need to do a better job of giving them support and help so that we can close that, that um, revolving door syndrome uh, since the majority of our inmates will be let out of prison and the majority of our inmates will be serving less than 10 years and they're going to be back in our communities in our neighborhoods uh, you know they may even work with you go to the same place you shop and park so it is so important that uh, we make certain that uh, they have the skills to become productive members of our society and i've introduced legislation that would help move that forward uh, also, Hawaii has been one of the very few states that don't have statewide standards for law enforcement officers. And this is an issue I've been working on for a few years. I'm happy to announce that we were able to pass a piece of legislation this year. It was introduced by Representative um, Nishimoto uh, in the House. And uh, we will now be able to have a certification, decertification of law enforcement officers. And this is not only county police, but uh, state police and law enforcement, we have uh, deputy sheriffs, our DLNR conservation officers, harbor police, airport police, even the attorney generals have individuals who carry guns and badges. And uh, since these individuals have an important authority over all of us, it's important that they are um, recruited properly, they have a good education, and they're well-trained and retrained and supervised. And this. Um, legislation uh, to give the statewide standards is going to go a long way in improving all of our law enforcement throughout the state. And the final issue I'd like to um, mention is homelessness and housing. For about the last 18 months, I've been the chair, the Senate chairman of the Senate Housing Committee. And as you know, homelessness is one of the primary issues that everyone talks about because we see it every day, it's in our face, it's in our parks, on our streets, in our neighborhoods. And this year, we did pass an unprecedented $50 million uh, to help the homeless uh, in areas like um, Housing First, um, Housing Reinvestment, uh, investing in social workers to help with people with mental illness, uh, drug addictions, a LEAD, it's a law enforcement assisted diversion for people that are arrested on misdemeanors and, and small petty crimes. Uh, 
if they promise and are willing to enter a program and, and, and improve their lives, you know, they won't go into the correctional system. Uh, we're, we're looking at uh, just ways to, to improve the skills. Some, some families just need um, uh, a little stipend because of an emergency. Uh, we we want to give uh, vouchers out. So it's a, a wide spectrum of services and programs that we need to continue to invest in to help these individuals with the intent that you must seek help, you must want help, and you must want to improve your lives. And not everybody um, falls in line immediately. Some individuals, as you know, we have to work with weeks or months or even years. Uh, but I do believe we can end homelessness. And, and finally, we also this year, we um, funded a, an unprecedented $600 million for affordable wow, housing. That's yes. big. Huge. Um, a couple of years ago, I uh, introduced the bill because we need to think big for $2 billion in, in housing. And, and a lot of people said, $2 million? Are you crazy? They'll never approve that. And unfortunately, they didn't. But what I did was I started that conversation. And na uh, this year, I reintroduced the same bill, but I brought it down from $2 billion to $1 billion, which is still a lot. But people still thought, well, you're going to be lucky if you get half of that. But um, we lobbied, we advocated, and you know, the finance and WAM chairs finally agreed that, yes, we need to do something huge for housing. So. We put $200 million into a rental housing revolving fund for affordable rentals and housing. And then we're giving a tax credit to builders and developers um, to the tune of $360 million over 12 years um, if they build and only if they build affordable housing and rentals. So there will be opportunities. And it's going to take us some time to get out of the housing crunch because we have to build. But as long as we continue funding large amounts for several years, you know, that's part of the solution of ending homelessness and, and driving the cost of living here because housing is the highest cost driver for most families, whether they're paying for a mortgage or rent. You know, it, it's expensive here and government can play a big role in making certain that affordable rentals and housing are built. Thank you for being so proactive in a lot of these issues that's very important to the people of Hawaii. I, I know that you have major community uh, involvement. There's such a long, Im impressive list of things that you've done in the community. Mm -hmm. But I want to ask you, why did you decide to run for lieutenant governor? Well, I have served for 19 years in the legislature and 27 years when you include the city and county. And I felt that um, with those years, I have a lot of experience, a lot of background, a lot of successes, and even a lot of wisdom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or maybe that's debatable, but. No, I'm sure you have great wisdom. You know, I'm, I'm 57 now. I'll be 58 on election day, November 6th. Uh, the primary, by the way, is August 11th. Let me plug that real quickly. But I felt, um, I had much to contribute. I, I could stay in the legislature or, you know, with uh, Senator or Lieutenant Governor Sutsui stepping down, he left an opening. And I saw, okay, this could be an opportunity for me. And after speaking with my family and supporters and friends, we felt this would be a great opportunity for me, for the state. And, uh, you know, I, I think I have the knowledge and I understand government and the people enough to, to, to come up with policies and, and shape plans that will be in the best interest of, of all of our residents. Um, uh, we need a champion. We need an advocate. We need a fighter. I've gained that reputation over the years of speaking out, being vocal, holding people accountable. And, and I want to redefine the position of lieutenant governor. Because some people have asked me, well, what does lieutenant governor do? They don't know. Because we haven't had uh, very active lieutenant governors. They've been involved, but I'd like to become a very active lieutenant governor. You heard some of the issues I've been working on. I want to continue working on those as well as many others uh, and be the partner that the governor needs in order to, 
to, to make the decisions that are going to help all of our residents. That sounds great to me that you want to redefine the role that the lieutenant governor has to really make a, a great impact. Yes. Um, share, share with me the, the vision that you have for the future of Hawaii. Okay, and, and that could be another two hours. <laughs> I'll, I will try to condense it. Uh, but, but certainly, tourism is going to be our number one industry for the longest time. So we need to look at industries and areas that will enhance tourism. And one area that can do that is culture and arts. I'd be a big supporter of culture and arts. And I want to make Hawaii an international premier destination for culture and arts. And when I talk culture and arts, I'm talking about you know, painters, um, you know, whether it's oil, acrylic, uh, watercolor. Uh, we have... Um, fashion designers, uh, architects, musicians, singers, dancers. I mean, Bruno Mars is at the top of the world and he's from Hawaii. Sure, sure. We have so many talented people here. Uh, I want to host the largest dance festival in the world across three months, all the neighbor islands, half of the performers local, half of them from, from uh, from international, uh, we, I'd like to see um, our urban art that you see all over. Um, we could build upon urban art. I want us to ha be become a, a fashion destination. Our retail sales are over a billion dollars, and there's no reason why our fashion designers couldn't tap into that. And and with a fashion industry, you have. So many, you have makeup, you have hair, although not in my case, but uh, <laughs> you have seamstress, there's so many um, other areas. But, but um, art and fashion, and especially with our host culture and hula, um, uh, we, can, we can support culture and art more to enhance tourism. And uh, sports, you know, you're a tennis pro. Um, sports can enhance tourism, become, become known, especially because of our weather. Uh, our sunny weather, um, uh, a destination for sports competition, for games, and, and then, as I mentioned earlier, uh, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, but it's STEAM now when you add the A for arts, and, and there are so many opportunities, especially with the internet, and to be able to market worldwide, and you know, have people come here and use their creativity and their innovation uh, to, to build uh, low capital, yet um, potentially high economic gains for our state. And, and a new area that um, a lot of people aren't aware of, but it is international, is, is the cryptocurrency industry. Uh, this is an area where I had legislation this year. It, it didn't um, pass, but um, there's some economic um, opportunities for people via cryptocurrency. Wow, that sounds exciting. It yes. sounds like there's such a great potential for Hawaii. Yes, there is. You know, Senator Will, I appreciate you being here as a guest, and with all of your experience and accomplishments, you seem to be the most qualified candidate for lieutenant governor. I, I like it, and I... I, I won't I, argue that point, <laughs> Leslie. <laughs> I, I really appreciate you being here, and uh, thank you. And thank you for watching Beyond the Lines. I'm Rusty Komori, and until next Monday, aloha.